my favorite session um, to chair because we will now be meeting the future winners of the Stephen Crower Award, the future impact story um, authors and the future members and chairs of Clarin committees. Um, this is a slightly different session because it will just be short pitches of four minutes for each uh, PhD student. Uh, there will be no question time at the end of the presentation because uh, we will uh, follow directly to the bazaar session where all the students will be presenting their posters so that they can discuss all the questions and comments that you have uh, in great detail um, at the bazaar. Uh, so I would like all of the students to follow the order as is in the program on the website of the Clarin uh, annual conference and just um, uh, follow one after the other, present themselves and the paper, um, and please try and really st stick to the four minutes so that we can uh, have the fancy dinner that has been organized for us. Who's first? Jon? And by the way, while we are uh, setting up the first presentation, the last presenter will present online, so there will be uh, a switch between Zoom and live session for the last presentation. Enjoy. All right. Uh, hello. My name is uh, Jon Frederik Lagason. I am a PhD student at the Department of Computer Science in Reykjavik University in Iceland. Uh, now, uh, the transformer is the neural network architecture of choice for tackling most NLP problems. It's a highly scalable architecture and uh, uh, Transformer-based language models have grown exponentially in size since uh, the architecture was first introduced about five years ago. Uh, in 2018, uh, BERT Large consisted of uh, 340 million parameters, while the Switch Transformer, which was published last year, consists of 1.6 trillion parameters. It's not only the size of the models that has been increasing, it's also the size of the pre-training datasets. Uh, BERT was pre-trained on 3.2 billion tokens, while DeepMind's uh, Chinchilla model, which was published this year, was uh, trained on uh, pre-trained on 1.4 trillion tokens. All right. So to sum up my research, uh, I'm, 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 with my research, I'm intending to answer this question: How can we efficiently pre-train language models when uh, language and computational resources are scarce? So with my research, I'm focusing on five different areas. Uh, first of all, I'm evaluating different software tokenization algorithms with regard to uh, data efficiency. So I'm comparing, for example, byte pattern coding, which is probably the most common, commonly uh, utilized uh, algorithm by far. Uh, I've been comparing that against the alternatives such as the Unigram algorithm. Uh, I've also been evaluating multilingual pre-training corpora. Uh, so multilingual models are common, uh, such as multilingual BERT and XLMR. Uh, these models are often trained on gigantic corpora consisting of uh, text from approximately 100 languages. Uh, researchers have recently suggested that for low resource languages for these, for which these models perform rather poorly, uh, it may be more advantageous uh, to uh, pre-train uh, a multilingual model on a small corpus consisting of a small number of uh, related languages instead. So that's another thing that I've been uh, experimenting with. Uh, I've also been looking at text filtering. So one of the reasons why uh, pre-training corpora have grown so large in size in recent years is that researchers are uh, increasingly making use of uh, web crawled corpora. Uh, which is uh, inherently quite noisy and must be filtered before before being used. Uh, so there's no standardized approach to text filtering. Uh, uh, many filters, which uh, many filters are quite aggressive, which uh, um, which uh, may be acceptable uh, when in situations where you have an abundance of pre-training data, but may do more harm than good in low resource settings. I've also been uh, evaluating the data efficiency of various pre-training tasks, such as BERT's masked language modeling task and Electra's replaced token detection task. Also been looking at the various forms of data augmentation, 
So they're setting back translated or machine translated text to the pre-training corpus. So just a light and quick overview of, of some of my results. Uh, I haven't found any appreciable difference between the performance of modules trained using uh, different software tokenization algorithms, but I have found that increasing the size of the vocabulary uh, for Icelandic at least does have a significantly, it can significantly improve the performance uh, of the model, uh, but this comes at the cost. The model takes more memory and uh, is slower during training and inference. Also, uh, I, I pre-trained the Nordic language model and evaluated on a selection of Icelandic uh, NLP tasks and found that it performed about as well as a monolingual model on average, but uh, it obtained significantly, statistically significantly higher results on a few tasks, uh, but worse on others. Text filtering, most commonly employed uh, text filters don't really have an effect. When, ev when I evaluated them on, a, on a, an Icelandic web corpus, but I did find that uh, certain classifiers, such as complexity based classifiers, were highly successful. So that's about it in four minutes. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please contact me. Uh, all of my experiments so far have been focused on Icelandic, but I'll be performing them on additional languages soon. So if any of this is of interest to you uh, and you'd like to maybe uh, work with me, uh, collaborate with me uh, with uh, performing these uh, experiments on additional languages, I'd be very happy to hear from you. Okay, thank you. Is the next one to present? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tess de Ahir, and uh, I would like to introduce my ongoing work regarding multilingual NLP on historical literature. So my project is funded by the Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure Project, and this is actually a consortium of universities across Europe who want to build these sound computational research infrastructures to study literature in the digital age. So that does not necessarily mean that we only build uh, tools, but we are mostly concerned with which materials humanists actually need to support their work and how we can link together the open source materials that already exist. So some universities are working on data sets, uh, others are working on mapping the user needs of the community. And we at the GAN Center for Digital Humanities, we are mostly focusing on methods. So more specifically on the integration of NLP methods such as named entity recognition, sentiment analysis and relation extraction to support digital literary analysis. NLP tools are often overlooked in humanist research. For one, because these tools uh, are actually not quite fit for historical texts yet. And also because humanist scholars, um, they often do not have enough technical knowledge of NLP to choose and adapt tools for their purpose. So as a consequence, these people often revert back to the methods, the research methods that they are more acquainted with. And this is a perfectly valid decision on their part, but as a consequence, we do have little insight on the application range of these tools. So long story short, we would like to try to close this gap between NLP and uh, DH by exploring the ways in which NER and sentiment analysis can support literary historical research. And then we would like to take a step back and turn the output into durable and reusable workflows. So these workflows will be developed based on a couple of case studies, which we will infer from a corpus of um, historical travel literature. And why travel literature? Well, content-wise, this is a very interesting source, as these texts can really serve as lenses into the past. So that allows us to reconstruct writer identities, historic environments and biodiversity, and also cultural traditions. Our corpus contains a very wide array of uh, different genres, ranging from journals to nature writing, and they're written in four different languages, namely German, uh, French, um, English, and Dutch. The texts range from the 16th to the 20th century, and thus account for a lot of linguistic and historical vari variation, as well as some of the typical computational challenges um, that we meet, which are OCR mistakes. 
So we want to annotate a sample of this corpus with two layers. So one is an entity layer, which includes mentions of flora, fauna, locations, and people, including the names of some ethnic groups, for example, organizations, and environmental entities. Think about weather phenomena, but also land cover and types of uh, landscapes. And on top of that, we want to add an aspect layer, which will be connected to these entities. So in theory, this would allow us to uh, work out a wide array of case studies on, for example, the attitude of travelers regarding some elements of the historical environment or the people that they meet, for example. And it will grant us more insight on the application range of named entity recognition and sentiment analysis for literary analysis. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, please find me at the poster session. <laughs> Uh, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Martel de Vos. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Radboud University and the Dutch Language Institute in the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm not here not so much as a technical expert, um, uh, but as a researcher and thus a user of all the wonderful things that technical experts can create. Um, and as part of my larger PhD project entitled Spread the News, Understanding Standardization of Dutch through 17th century newspapers, uh, I performed a study that served as a use case uh, for several tools created by the Dutch Claudia, uh, which is what this presentation and my poster presentation is on. Um, and as the title of my uh, presentation kind of gives away, uh, this study was on strong verbs uh, in Dutch. Now the Dutch language contains several strong verbs, which are divided into seven uh, different verb classes based on the ablaut. And over time, some of these verbs have undergone language change. And this happened, for example, uh, to the verbs from verb class three. This can be illustrated with the verb zingen, which means to sing. Um, and this strong verb displayed a three-part ABC paradigm in Middle Dutch. So we had zingen, zong, zungen, and gezungen. And with zong, so the A form uh, being used for preterite singular, um, so I, you, he, or she sang, uh, and zungen for preterite plural, so we, you, or they sang. But nowadays, Standard Dutch has lost this preterite uh, singular A variant uh, in these verbs and just uses the same form uh, for singular and plural, thus displaying an ABB paradigm, zingen, zungen, and gezungen. So we see a change from A to O in the preterite singular. And in a large corpus study on strong verbs in Dutch, Isabeau de Smith uh, has shown that this change solidified in the 17th century. And that's also a century that's known for the start of the standardization of Dutch. So while de Smith acknowledges that standardization may have played a role here, she focuses her analysis on possible language internal factors influencing this change therefore leaving the following question unanswered, could standardization have played a part here? Um, oh, and just to clarify, by standardization, I really mean the codification of Dutch that started in the late 16th and early 17th century. Now, in my poster presentation, um, I will present the results of a study carried out to try and answer this question um, following the precept versus uh, practice method. And I firstly, I performed a study on the norms for 41 uh, 17th century class three verbs uh, by mapping out all of the stances on these verbs encountered uh, in the 10 normative grammars on standard Dutch written between 1550 and 1650. And secondly, I investigated the actual use of these 41 verbs in 17th century newspapers. And it's that second study, so of the usage of these verbs that also provided a use case for Claria tools, uh, such as Black Lab, um, and different platforms and frameworks for linguistic annotation of historical Dutch. And um, for this second study, I use the new Couranten corpus, which is a corpus containing newspapers from 1618 until 1700 uh, of about 19 million words in total. And all the newspaper issues were manually transcribed by volunteers. So we have a fairly high data quality compared to OCR Red Corpora. Um, but the annotation, post-tagging, and lemmatization uh, was done automatically, and very much so forms an alpha version. 
So for my method, I did a corpus search in this corpus for all possible verb forms of these last three strong verbs, while trying to include all expected ver spelling variation and allowing for early modern clitics. And it's the things highlighted in blue here um, that I focused on in my use case. So the automatic tags and the corpus search possibilities. Um, and as stressed before, I've assessed these not as an expert, technical expert, which I'm definitely not when it comes to the technique, uh, but as a user. Um, and the focus of my paper, my poster presentation is therefore on this second study and its use of the corpus and tools addressing questions such as, uh, were the search possibilities sufficient? Can we still draw valid conclusions from noisy material, et cetera? So um, please come and see my poster. I'm hoping to see you there. Excellent. I'm Saite. I am from Utilitas Magnus University, Lithuania, and my I'm going to present you is adjectivization of participles in Lithuanian. Uh, to begin with, Lithuanian is a synthetic language with a lot of forms, particularly verbs have a lot of forms. They can be conjugated, inflected, uninflected, and uh, inflected verbal forms are participles. Here we can see some examples of Lithuanian participles. Valgantis vaikas, eating child, nupirktas maistas, uh, food bot, skaita mizodži, words that are bearing red, and so on. Um, participles have an ambivalent nature. Traditionally, they are considered as verbal forms. However, they are also similar to adjectives. For example, Lithuanian participles have a meaning of verb, categories of voice and tense, verbal arguments. For example, vakar nupirktas maistas, food that has been bought yesterday. Uh, but also they are inflected like adjectives, have degrees, pronominal forms, and share the same syntactic functions. Um, however, some participles can lose verbal properties. In that case, they can become adjectives, or in other words, adjectivized participles. For example, iprastas, meaning usual, verb iprasti, to get used to, nepakartojamas, unforgettable, verb nepakartoti, not to repeat, nevikas, unsuccessful, verb nevikti, not to happen, užimtas, busy, verb užimti, to occupy. They all have a form of participles, but they are adjectivized, game adjectives. Uh, the problem is that sometimes it is difficult to differentiate between adjectivized and simple participles. However, it's important to do so for lexicographical works, part of speech tagging, teaching foreigners Lithuanian, and so on. So the aim of my uh, PhD thesis is to find criteria to differentiate between adjectives and participles that have similar function. Lithuanian participles and adjectives. Mm -hmm. um, to find possible criteria, uh, theoretical works were analyzed and a pilot study was conducted. Uh, during the pilot study, 160 frequent verbs and 43 adjectives with forms of participles were analyzed. The sources of pilot study are lexical database of Lithuanian language usage, pedagogic corpus of Lithuanian, and corpus of contemporary Lithuanian language. These, uh, the corpora are available at Kularin LT repository. Um, when these criteria, criteria were analyzed, they were grouped into four categories. This criteria can be semantic, grammatical, derivational, and statistical. So for those who are interested, more information about criteria can be provided during the bazaar. Uh, and in the future, it is planned to clarify this criteria to use more objective criteria to identify ad adjectivized participles, for example, more statistical criteria. Um, and also it's planned to analyze more words, to classify participles by the degree of adjectivization because they also can be partly adjectivized. So the problem is really big. Uh, and one of the possible results would be word lists in which participles would be classified by the degree of adjectivization. And it is planned that this word list would appear in Clarin LT repository. So thank you for your attention. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. 
I am Zara Kuncheva. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Information and Communication Technologies in the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And now I will briefly show you my work on the semantic classification of prepositions in the Butri Bank WordNet. So the aim is to incorporate prepositions in the Butri Bank WordNet for Bulgarian. As any other closed class words, uh, prepositions are typically missing in WordNets. So for the aim of the research, a semantic classification is compiled from Bulgarian grammars. Uh, the integration of prepositions in the WordNet as a long-term goal will benefit uh, the building of neural models for Bulgarian. And with the success of this task, uh, a WordNet for Bulgarian, which is suitable for semantic annotation, will be available in the framework of Clarin, and it uh, will provide processing of semantically annotated corpora. Why prepositions? Because they have a substantial role in many NLP tasks, but their disambiguation constitutes one of the greatest challenges in this research area. Uh, on the other hand, prepositions would seriously benefit the utility of WordNets for tasks like semantic annotation, uh, language models, word tense disambiguation, etc. A few words about the classification. So the adapted version consists of uh, 15 categories, uh, such as location, time, transition, etc. And here you can see just one example. I received news from the homeland. Here the preposition from um, uh, expresses the sense of the origin category. And below is the list of uh, the scene set categories. But, uh, uh, we will have more time about them during the poster session. So a few words about the model for preposition synsets. Um, they will have a detailed definition, synonyms if available, and as many as possible examples. Also, the semantic classics um, of the prepositions will be used for the categories of the synset. Uh, two type of relations, uh, relations are planned, uh, first between prepositions and other parts of speech. For example, uh, verbs, um, the Bulgarian verbs pretend and turn in combined with the preposition na uh, always express uh, the sense of transition in new different state, but there are many similar cases to be further explored. And secondly, there are relations between prepositions in sets. Uh, for example, uh, many prepositions have uh, synonyms and antonyms, like uh, the preposition on uh, and under are ant antonyms. And to conclude, uh, this work shows uh, the initial step uh, towards the large scale integration of prepositions in the Butri Bank WordNet, which is motivated by uh, various NLP applications. A semantic preposition classification is done for this purpose. Uh, and a few words about the future work, uh, the combinations of verbs and prepositions, which express specific senses, will be further explored. And also the analysis will be elaborated with hierarchy inheritance with the categorization of the verbs and nouns in WordNet, with more relations and with features from a valency lexicon. And uh, last but not least, a good coverage of prepositions in a WordNet uh, will lead uh, to a better quality of language models. Thank you for the attention. Uh, hello, my name is Agnieszka Karlińska. I am a DH specialist at the Digital Humanities Center at the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, which has a long history of, of, I think, fruitful collaboration with Clarin PL. Uh, at the same time, I am pursuing a PhD in sociology at the University of Warsaw. My research is situated at the intersection of legal and medical sociology, sociolinguistics, and Sorry, computational I mean, linguistics. We still don't see the slide. I see it now. Yeah. Apologies for the technical hiccups. Uh, okay, so uh, I explore how the meaning of uh, normality or rather sanity is developed at the interface of, of law and psychiatry. And I reconstruct linguistic strategies adopted by forensic psychiatrists providing expert witness reports in terms of reconciling the discourses of law and medicine. I argue that the role of a forensic psychiatrist uh, is linked to that of a translator. And they, their task is to translate medical findings into explanations understandable to the legal community. The process of translation leads to ethical, institutional, and discursive challenges. I aim to show how these challenges are manifested at the level of text 
and how much is lost in the translation. I assume that expert reports do not have the status of objective personal documents and psychiatrists make, make specific lexical and narrative choices that affect the reception of their texts. Um, I compiled a unique corpus of 225 uh, forensic reports issued by Polish experts uh, tax, tasked with assessing the sanity of the defendants. It consists of more than 1.5 million tokens. I, of course, digitize and fully anonymize the documents. And my study is based on the mixed methods approach. Uh, I combine computational text analysis and discourse analysis developed in the sociology of science and discursive psychology. Uh, my research is the first case of applying such methods to explore uh, psychiatric reports. Employing tools provided by, provided by Clarin PL, thank you for that. I compare forensic reports uh, with strictly medical and strictly legal text to capture their, their specificity. And I also compare reports concerning men with reports on women to show linguistic processes of constructing gender representations of defendants. And my findings um, so far indicate that it is extremely difficult for Polish psychiatrists to abandon the lexical patterns uh, used in everyday medical practice and to replace the doctor-patient relationship with an expert-subject relationship. I observe that uh, psych psychiatrists constrain the presence of the author's voice, their own, own voices, and do not use the narrative form in the, in the reports, and also they do not strive to develop a style specific to psychiatric reports writing. I also unfortunately confirmed the persist persistence of traditional representations of femininity and masculinity in forensic psychiatric discourse. That is all for now. I look forward to discussing my research a little bit more during the poster session. So thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Matej Klemen and I am from the University of Ljubljana and I'll be presenting some initial work on neural metaphor detection for Slovene. And this is work done with my mentor, Marko robink and so a lot of this presentation is going to be quite hand wavy, but see me after the presentation for the full story. Okay, so but before talking about the actual methods and results, I want to introduce the metaphors and why I want to detect them first. So in case you don't know what I would say metaphors are, are an expression that uses a comparison with another concept in order to um, improve the for a rhetorical effect. So instead of saying, for example, that his words really offended me, we might say that his words cut deeper than a knife. So comparing this offense to a cut of a knife. And so being able to detect these metaphors enables some cool applications that I'm interested in, namely automatic creative writing. So if we're able to detect these metaphors, we might be able to curate them and reuse them for a cool applications such as headline generation. And the second application I want to mention is this automatic um, language analysis. So, for example, being able to uh, see how people express themselves about towards a certain group or through time. Okay, so now that we know what metaphors are, um, I want to move on to my actual work. So we've used two corpora off of Clarin repository, namely Comet and Gcomet. And these are two corpora of varying size and of varying genre distribution. So Comet is a bit more general domain and Gcomet is, uh, contains more spoken language and this contains between two and 5% of positive instances. So words that are metaphors. And then we've took, a, we took those um, corpora and we've applied a standard token classification uh, pipeline to them using two of these large language models um, called transformers. So namely this uh, multilingual or sorry, trilingual cross lingual BERT model and the monolingual slow BERTA model, both again available from the Clarin repository. And additionally, we've experimented with another model um, that is trained on more lang languages, but is not available on Clarin. And so the initial results I'm showing now are F1 scores, which basically capture the trade-off between um, how well the model is able to detect the metaphors and how many of all the metaphors present in a text it is able to detect. So a high, higher number is better here and the numbers range from zero, which is the worst and one, which is the best. And for reference, I've put here a random baseline, which is just a method that randomly guesses with a 50-50 chance that something is a metaphor, just so we know that we're not wasting our time here. Um, and so what we can see is that the monolingual model performs best, which is expected, followed by this trilingual model. 
and we found um, that these models, which kind of achieve somewhat solid results, actually are able to pick out the easy metaphors, which are prepositions. So these results that are quite optimistic are even worse in um, practice, which is uh, indicated by this second bottom part. And so to conclude my presentation, I want to mention some future directions that I'll be taking. And first is considering metaphors as spanning instead, instead of tokens. So currently I took this as an individual classification of words, but now I want to consider them uh, jointly. The second is this cross-link or transfer. So um, taking uh, resources from a different language and using it to improve the metaphor detection in Slovene and vice versa. And last, uh, using this on some cool applications. And if you work on any of those, please also stop by my talks. Or if you can't make it, you can contact me on this mail. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Lucia Krusic from the Institute Center for Information Modeling from the University of Graz. And today I'll be talking about sentiments uh, towards migrants from Southeast Europe to um, Austria or the sentiment analysis of Austrian newspapers. Um, so my interest in this topic uh, is twofold. On one hand, I'm really interested in the method of sentiment analysis, which is the automatic detection of sentiments, emotions, and opinions uh, in texts. And on the other hand, uh, I'm really interested in migration uh, in Austria, which has a really long tradition of being a destination for migrants uh, for many reasons, both from uh, socioeconomic uh, or geographical uh, reasons. But however, um, nowadays the political narrative in Austria still refuses this notion of it being a country which is shaped by migration. Um, and with um, research has shown that actually the first wave of migration to Austria has happened uh, during the Habsburg era. And consistently during time, uh, there has been various waves of migration to this day. Uh, one of which was the so-called refugee crisis during 2015, in which Austria was the fourth uh, receiving country from the EU. Um, and during that time, many studies have fo focused on migration um, and, and uh, sentiment analysis, uh, which were mostly based on uh, detecting the sentiments in public opinion in social media. Um, and they were doing that using machine learning techniques uh, for which kind of we need this prerequisite of large training corpora. Um, so on to my study, uh, the research questions and goals that I have. Uh, the main research question that I have for my thesis is basically what was the predominant sentiments towards migrants in Austrian new newspapers in different time periods? So was the overall sentiment positive or negative? And how has that sentiment changed over time? And my end goal is kind of twofold also to fill the gap on migration research through a long time span investigation, and also to try to contribute to sentiment analysis in German by providing an annotated corpus and by conducting sentiment analysis on historical newspaper data. Um, so this is my corpus. Uh, the ANO corpus, the corpus of Austrian newspapers, which is made available by the Austrian National Library. Uh, it's online and you can um, access various newspapers, uh, both by uh, thematic um, categories and also by dates. And the time span which I'll be focusing on is on newspapers from the 18th to mid 20th century. Um, because it corresponds to uh, three large migration periods. Uh, in this period, I found around a million daily and around 100,000 weekly issues of newspapers. Um, so this is kind of my workflow. Uh, since I've just started my thesis, I'm still on step one, which is data preparation, the selection of newspapers, and the correction of noisy OCR. Uh, in the future, I want to um, kind of prepare this annotation schema with the CATMA tool. Uh, and then uh, after I have my gold standard uh, to try and fine tune uh, BERT model, which is already trained on European newspapers. And the end goal is kind of to share uh, and make that corpus available in our GAMS repository and uh, through that also in the VLO. Um, so thank you so much. And if you have any suggestions or questions, please visit my poster.
So good afternoon, everyone. Okay, uh, my name is Roberta Biancaruzzetti. I'm a PhD student in linguistics at the University of Pisa, and I collaborate with the Computational Linguistic Institute of the CNR of Pisa on the validation of the Archivio Vivo architecture, which is hosted by the Clarinet, for conducting a sociophonetic investigation on Tuscan vernacular, which is the object of my PhD. Uh, the project provides an interdisciplinary research framework at the crossroad between linguistics and digital humanities. The um, idea consists in reusing spontaneous spoken data from an historical archive initially conceived for other non-linguistic purposes for uh, investigating the presence of the residual uh, phonetic phenomenon of rhotic dissemination in Tuscan vernacular and employing the innovative clarinet architecture Archivo Vivo. The archive was collected by the historian Angela, uh, Angela Spinelli at the beginning of the 1980s, uh, who conducted face-to-face -face interviews among the inhabitants of three, of three towns in uh, the rural area of Prato for the preservation of their memories about the historical events that happened during the post-Second World War period in that area. Um, the archive consists of more than 120 hours of recording plus metadata, such as notes and uh, drawings, and was digitized in 2011 within the Grafo project in collaboration between the University of Siena and Normale di Pisa. Uh, to date, however, the archive is unfortunately um, currently unavailable for consultation online due to reconstructing work on the original website. Therefore, the goals of the project are to safely store, preserve, organize, and especially for my case, explore the content of the archive and to conduct the sociophonetic analysis on the recordings. Uh, the first step consists in adding uh, the archive to the Archivio Vivo architecture, which was built within the Italian Clarion Consortium with the aim to define and develop a model for the management, protection, and enhancement of the archival heritage. Within this architecture, the data can be uh, preserved long-term thanks to the preservation copy and access for consultation through the archival units, which are data and documents pertaining to the same communicative event. Um, the second step involves, the, uh, involves to listen and transcribe the recording of the uh, Spinelli archive. The third step consists in extracting the relevant chunks of audio containing the target words uh, to then proceed with the fourth step involving the phonetic annotation and acoustic analysis with the software Pratt. Finally, the project also foresees the use of additional innovative tools for linguistic analysis that are accessible from the Clarion VLO, such as visible vowels, which is deposited in Lindat, and possibly also the new uh, visible consonants as soon as it will be available on the platform. Um, in conclusion, my PhD research project constitutes a real case of interdisciplinary work that benefits from the innovative tools developed within the Clarinet uh, research infrastructure, uh, represents the opportunity to uh, test the adaptability of the uh, Kibio Vivo architecture, offering additional validation, validation on its access accessibility and reusability for different types of, of archives. Uh, will favor the emergence of new ideas and implementation of additional features uh, to the platform. And last but not least, we'll show once again the potential of uh, legacy data to be available source for linguistic research within the real-time paradigm. Thank you. Hi. I'm Ansi Moseo from Aalto University, and I'll present my PhD project, but I would also like to advertise this new speech corpus that we have recently published uh, called Lahjota Puhetta, which means donate speech in Finnish. So the PhD project is about grammar aware neural methods to modeling meaning in natural language. And the main research question is how can we evaluate and improve language models capacity to compositional generalization and by compositional generalization, I mean the ability to understand and create novel combinations of familiar primitives. So I focus on the level of morphology. So in this case, um, 
compositional generalization means uh, to understand and create new words um, using familiar morphemes, uh, like in this unmisunderstandable example. And I use um, data provided by Finn Clarin in this work. And then about the Lahjelta Puetta Corpus. So this is a large colloquial Finnish speech corpus. Um, so it's completely spontaneous speech and it's collected using a website and a smartphone application where anyone can just go and donate a speech in Finnish. And so far we have over 3000 hours of speech from over 20,000 speakers and about 1,600 hours of this is transcribed. So it's about 50 times more than what we previously had um, in this domain of colloquial Finnish speech uh, for research purposes. And we have um, metadata uh, associated with it which uh, with each recording so we know that the speakers come from diverse backgrounds in terms of dialect age uh, location and other metadata and you can request access to the corpus uh, on kielipank the language bank of finland uh, which is maintained by finclarin group and we have also trained uh, speech recognition models that we have uh, uploaded for anyone to use freely. And uh, we have recently published a paper about this, if you want to read more. Okay. Thanks. Uh, come see my question. Uh, hi, I'm Jim O'Regan from KTH in Stockholm. And um, my current project is ASR fine tuning for minority languages and for speaker adaptation. So uh, this is basically the transformer, but applied to sound. So transformers have been mentioned a couple of times so far. You take a pre-trained base model, uh, trained on a large amount of uh, broad data, and then fine tune it for a particular task. The particular example uh, model that's working quite well is Waftevec, and particularly these two models from Facebook that are trained on many languages. And so for minority languages, there are five recognized uh, languages in Sweden. We don't really care about Finnish because as we saw in the last talk, Finnish is quite well taken care of. Romani and Yiddish don't have too much representation in media. But uh, Sami and Mienkili have uh, representation in Swedish radio, at least. So we have some audio, even though we don't particularly, we don't have a lot of transcribed audio. So the aim here is to provide speech infrastructure for at least some of the minority languages. So with Mienkili, we can use Finnish ASR because uh, Mienkili and Finnish diverged a couple of hundred years ago, but they're still highly mutually intelligible. Sami, it's basically back to using older uh, uh, techniques like phonetic triangulation using multiple phonetic matchers. So for the other task for speaker adaptation, we're trying to improve speech recognition for individual speakers. The particular examples, uh, we so the first example is using Riksta data. Uh, we have a project that involves uh, finding uh, attitudes to terrorism within uh, the Swedish parliamentary recordings. And we hope to extend this to, uh, because we have 70 years of data coming from Riksdag that we can uh, analyze language change over those 70 years. But uh, other applications will be uh, local recordings and uh, people of particular historical in interest. And so Using 300 updates, just continuing the fine tuning process, we found that it more or less started to improve once you give it 20 minutes of data, which is surprisingly little. 
And if you let it run even longer, you get even better results still with tiny amounts of data. And I think I'm done. Hello, I'm Christine Levan Petrova, and I am a researcher in the Institute of Mathematical and Computer Science at the University of Latvia. And I will tell you about the balanced corpus of modern Latvian and about the, uh, from the developments of the corpus uh, from the beginnings and I'll till the present days. And the latest uh, version of this corpus, LVK 2018, of course, is available uh, at the, uh, on the web and also is registered at the Clarin LV repository. Uh, and the new version of LVK. 2022 will be released in the late uh, in in some months uh, in the late 2022, and we are all excited and waiting for this corpus. And uh, a little about the history: uh, the balanced corpus of modern Latvian has been developed in uh, multiple rounds, and the history of this corpus goes back to uh, 2007 when the uh, first million corpus was released and created, and uh, uh, it was created manually. And uh, this uh, the design compilation and the text selection criteria of this corpus were based on the Latvian language corpus conception. And of course, uh, we took also the experience from the other language corpora uh, into account, for instance, BNC, Czech national corpus, and etc. Uh, so, um, design principles of LVK, this main pin principles in the general corpus, uh, uh, balanced, of course, and it's synchronic uh, corpus uh, that re represents the synchronic state of the language. Uh, original corpus uh, should uh, contain only text originally written in Latvian. Uh, and, of course, we attend uh, that corpus to be representative. And uh, of course, if the uh, corpus is balanced, there should be some <laughs> estimated proportions, some sections. And uh, the corpus contains uh, five sections, five different check sections. It is journalism, and fiction, scientific, legal, and uh, parliamentary transcripts. Um, and of course, to fill the sections with the text, with the respective texts, uh, there are also some text selection criteria set up. And uh, for instance, it is time. Uh, we are including corpus just uh, full texts. Uh, of course, diversity text should cover as wide range of topics as possible. Uh, uniqueness, uh, the corpus sample should not be represented uh, in corpus more times than just once. And of course, the quality and uh, of course, other texts uh, selection criteria. And as I said uh, in the beginning, uh, we are now uh, on the way on the LVK 2022, and this corpus will be released in some months and will contain uh, 100 million words. Uh, and uh, also this new, new corpus uh, that will be released in some months uh, um, are the um, extended versions of the previous LVK series uh, containing all text included in the LVK 2018, but the corpus design criteria uh, will differ from the previous LVK corpora. For instance, uh, uh, the new corpus will include also um, translations, not just uh, originally written texts in, in Latvian. And of course, so all, all this uh, corpora and subcorpora have been released in the framework of uh, Latvian National Corpus and registered, as I said, is in Clarin LV repository. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And now last but not least, we have one student presenter uh, that will uh, do his uh, presentation via Zoom. Johannes, can we hear you? Can we see you? Hello? Hello. You need to let us know when you want us to switch to the next slide and our technical assistant will do this for you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Johannes Sibeko from Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. 
My PhD study is titled Measuring Text Readability in Sesotho. My presentation today is focused on the use of classical readability formulas to measure text readability in Sesotho. Next slide, please. Sesotho is spoken by more than 10 million speakers across Southern Africa, that is Lesotho, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. For my study, I am using the South African orthography. Next slide, please. The main study focuses on the question of how text readability could be measured in Sesotho. We also aimed to automate this process. We also consider the possibility of using translated text with English and Dutch as helper languages. We then opted for using classical readability metrics. That is, we are adapting already existing classical readability metrics into Sesotho. Next slide, please. We identify a total of nine classic readability formulas for adaptation into Sesotho. The flash insight grade level, the flash reading is, the me simple measure of Cobeldigo and the gunning fog index, which are based on syllable counts. Next slide, please. The Coleman Liao index, the automatic readability index, the last Barrett's index, and the rate index that are based on weight length. Next slide, please. We also considered the Dilchal index, uh, which is different from the other metrics in that it uses a frequency, frequency list of 3,000 words that a grade for learner should be able to read. Next slide, please. We surveyed the two digital language resources available on the South African um, Center of Digital Language Resources repository. Our publication is in copy editing stages. From the investigation, we discovered that there were no syllabification systems publicly available to Sesotho. As a result, we developed two syllabification systems. We based our syllabification rules on Kuma schools for syllabification in Sesotho that were published in 1982. We then extracted words and their syllabified counterparts from the Bukanzui Yamachabaya Sesotho, that is the International Dictionary of Sesotho. After manual cleaning and fixing orthographic inconsistencies, we obtained a total of 1,355 words. The rule-based system achieved an accuracy rate of 99.69%. We then experimented with the text-based approach. We used the same wait list for training and testing the machine learning system. We achieved an accuracy rate of 78.92%. Uh, we then realized that some of the mistakes were caused by the manual editing, but both systems were uploaded onto Sadila's repository. Additionally, we also uploaded the wait list onto the repository. We have been granted access to exam text by the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. We have thus extracted reading comprehension and summary writing text from the grade 12 text for all 11 official languages. The grade 12 is the uh, school exit grade in South Africa. The texts are categorized into two, that is the home language and the first additional language text. Our former research has indicated that the English texts show consistently different readability levels for the home language and the first additional language text. We are hopeful that the differences are uniform throughout the different languages. As such, we are hoping to also use this text when we test our readability metrics. We also surveyed methods for measuring text readability in low resource languages like Sisutu. Our manuscript is under consideration for publication. One of the common methods identified was the use of translated text between the helper language and the lower resource language. To this end, we are also compiling a machine translated corpus that will contain text translated between English as a helper language and Sesotho and between Dutch as a helper language and Sesotho. We are hoping that this method will help us identify text properties that make Sesotho text easier to read. We also hope that um, we also hope to explore cross-lingual projection from Dutch or English to Sesotho. We are open to ideas on how to compile the list of frequently used words. We have ideas, but we are not yet confident on using them. Finally, we are hoping to incorporate all, this, uh, all the successful adapted metrics in an online text readability assessment tool that will be publicly available. Perhaps I might be able to present on this next day. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Johannes.
And uh, with this, uh, we conclude the PhD session. And uh, based on what we have heard, um, uh, we can be confident that the next generation of the Claring community will be highly innovative, very heterogeneous in terms of research focus, uh, and also extremely well organized. So I think the future is bright.